Jason Verwast, and he's going to talk about harnessing AI for automatic subtitling. Take it away. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so we're going to talk for a couple of minutes uh, on the specific subject of subtitling, subtitling same language and subtitling uh, to uh, other languages. Um, the latter being obviously an issue in Europe because we have uh, 27 official languages and the European Commission does all they can to promote the, the proliferation of European works throughout Europe and beyond. Um, Limecraft is, uh, is incorporated in 2010 as a, an asset management offering. Our customers are producers, distributors, broadcast stations, um, and initially we focused a lot on processing raw material, automating the inflow into uh, post-production, and uh, eventually, two years ago, we added the subtitling part to the workflow because our offering wants to be a complete workflow from the, uh, from the, the capturing down to the distribution. Um, with Limecraft Flow, which is a browser-based application, and the uh, Ingest software, which runs local, we make more or less complex workflows covering fiction, documentary, entertainment, and a lot of e-learning applications, basically. It's a simple, uh, a relatively simple workflow, but there's a couple of cameras, uh, recording uh, management out there. Um, and then we automate all the steps back and forth post-production and eventually we do the dispatching to the video on demand services. Um, customers include uh, VRT France Television, BBC, YLE, so broadcast stations and post facilities and independent producers. Uh, but we're going to talk for a couple of minutes on the subject of AI. Uh, one of the engines we're using is obviously Video Indexer. Um, and what we found is that it, it, it's, it's quite a fancy including AI in your offering, but to that point it's just a tool, it's an instrument. So we asked ourselves the question, on behalf of our customers, how can we leverage this intelligence? What to do with it? How do we cope with this incredible overflow of metadata which has been generated? How do we make it usable? Um, and let's, because we're heading towards subtitling, let's explore uh, what we did with uh, transcription and how we eventually ended into uh, subtitling. And then we'll have a short demo as well. Um, in total, we support over 100 languages uh, because we're running a couple of speech-to-text engines in the background. And obviously, the m most uh, the, 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 the lowest hanging fruit is, uh, was for archive operators. Checking in hundreds of hours of material per day and speech transcription makes that content searchable. That's the easy use case. That's what most asset management vendors have in their uh, offering. Um, the speech to text on its own is followed up, is extended with uh, auto tagging auto-categorization, uh, which is a useful use case on its own, but uh, we went uh, a bit further. This is another interesting use case where we, in a, in a fiction context, where we would uh, listen to the actors' voices and match the shots with the screenplay, so to automatically uh, prepare the rough cut for the editor. And uh, now we, we're coming to the, to the more uh, interesting details. Uh, the third application was uh, using uh, speech transcription for the purpose of documentary making. We learned that documentary makers hire students or interns to transcribe the content in a Word document, print it out, and then they do the paper edit by using a color marker they will uh, highlight a quote. Uh, that becomes the, the parts of a storyboard and that's how they prepare their edit. And we just did the same, only now it happens in a browser. Um, and then uh, in uh, 2015 uh, in Europe, um, we had the European Accessibility Act 
And in the United States, we have the American Disabilities Act, which all of a sudden made it mandatory to put closed captions on your content. So uh, a few broadcasters out there asked us, uh, um, hey, Linecraft, you, you mastered speech to text. Why don't you come up with a piece of software that takes the transcript, takes into account all the applicable timing and styling rules, and cuts the transcript into properly spotted, properly timed subtitles? It was, from an engineering point of view, it was a horrible challenge. It was much more complex than um, it looked like. So the current uh, BBC and PO uh, were, the, were the lead users. Um, uh, bear with me that in, in Europe we've been using subtitles for um, since the 70s and quality standards are really high. Um, um, so, where a speech technology has been in the market for 30 years and easy to implement, doing the cut from a transcript into subtitles didn't exist. And the BBC style guide, just to give you an idea, is a document over 100 pages specifying all the timing rules for subtitles. Minimum two seconds and a half on screen, maximum five seconds. Unless you're close to a shortcut, then we can extend it a little bit because subtitles should be aligned along the rhythm of the edit. For the BBC, we need to spot them exactly on the shortcut, whereas for Netflix, we need to stay away three frames from the shortcut. So when we're dispatching BBC content for Netflix distribution abroad, we need to modify the, the template. And all that intelligence, we, we, we put it in software. So um, when, you have, when you start from the transcription and you hit automatic subtitling, um, let's, let, let's just see if we can uh, go to a demo here. Um, where's the pointer? Yeah. Yeah. So bring it over to the left and it's right there. Once it's yeah. ready, it'll pop up over here. So you're going to do a web browser. Yeah. You have to physically drag it to the right so it's not going to be there. So, there we go. Uh, this piece of uh, content has been. Uh, has been transcribed as the result of the transcription. Hi, and welcome to Localization Essentials. My name is Sven, and I'm... You notice that every word is time-coded, and we can make uh, fancy applications like clicking in the text, the playhead will follow. Um, but we'll uh, open up... Uh, What is wrong? It's going too fast here. Brilliant. We have the text. We have all those timing and styling rules in the config page. We can turn the buttons if you want. If you're Premier League football and the speaker has a 240 word per minute pace, they need 60 characters on the line, whereas the BBC would say 37 characters. And if you're publishing on social media, you even want to go smaller to 35, depends on the use case. But let's cut this piece uh, of five minutes in subtitles. Uh, it's going to take between 10 and 20 seconds to take uh, the time transcript and the shortcuts, if there are any, these are talking heads, to come back with the closed captions. From Norway. And I'm Christina from Lebanon. We both... Machine transcription is a source of errors, so I didn't cheat. 
My name is Fen and I'm from Norway. Then there should be a speaker change, but because there was no pause, it couldn't detect a speaker change. This is best effort. You would then need to go into the editor, say, control enter and split the subtitles. But uh, according to BBC statistics, um, we're still saving between 80 and 90% of the turnaround time to create subtitles with uh, this method. Um, we guarantee that using the text, these are uh, as close as possible to of official uh, uh, timelines. And when it was not possible to accommodate all the styling rules, we'll put a gentle warning sign for the, for the media manager or the subtitle operator. So he or she can now decide to either modify the content or the timing or to publish it as such. When for the hard of hearing, uh, it might be necessary to have a literal transcription and then we we'll leave it as such. Um, you can obviously export the subtitles in a couple of uh, formats. Uh, SRT is the most common and you can use SRT files for uh, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, most content delivery networks will support uh, SRT files. Uh, so, as I suggested in the introduction, in Europe we have a couple of languages and producers have an interest in localizing their content. So um, we added um, machine translation to the e equation. Um, let's say we're going, we, we need to address a, a, a Latin American uh, audience. We're gonna translate it on the spot into Spanish. Um, engineering wise, this was even more complex. The subtitles have changed, have been changed by the subtitle operator. So we can't use the original transcript. We take the subtitle template, we reconstruct like a pseudo script, we translate it, and then there's a lot of time management going on because machine translation is not aware of time codes. We are, but machine translation is not. Then we have the time translated and time coded script, which we then cut again into subtitles along the same rhythm. Work as part of the localization team here at Google and will be your guides into the world of localization. Not fluent in Spanish, so what is localization? So tell you this is in the world of information technology, localization means translating and adapting a product or service to a particular language, culture or and geographic good, market. But and there are two main aspects to in, that. In the first one is stylistic. You have to make sure the language tone you use is appropriate for each local culture. Uh, but then there's also a technical aspect. You may have to make changes to things like date and time so formats, alphabetization, or even the... So, what we're looking at is um, no rocket science, honestly. We've taken the tools that are on the market, ASR, cutting in subtitles, machine translation, we've made a properly working combination of those, but this is a real use case, this is a valuable use case which uh, saves our, our users, producers, distributors, broadcasters, uh, e-learning applications a lot of time. Um, I'm saving myself the hassle from going back to the PowerPoint, but um, if you want, there is a free trial available uh, or info at limecraft.com. Um, we're happy to support you in some uh, test samples. Um, do you guys have an open API? Sure, so we do. Can we're going to repeat the question so everybody live can hear it. The question was, do, you, do they have an open API? Of course we do. Um, every possible action you can do on a on a video item on the transcript on a piece of the subtitles is available through the API and as a matter of fact I think 50% of our use comes from third party applications that don't use the user interface but just use parts of the of the backend Wonderful do we have any other questions for Martin Yeah let me bring the mic over to you Can you start from a different language, Hindi, for example? 
uh, we can start from different languages then you uh, import the, the given subtitle file to be very honest with you there is two separate use cases the first one is same language subtitling usually for accessibility purposes where we turn domestic audio into domestic subtitles the different use case is the Netflix like use case we have original content in whatever language usually comes with a set of subtitles done in the first use case and the challenge for the language service provider for the translation agency is then to translate the given subtitles into another language which saves us the burden of doing speech recognition which is the biggest source of errors so yes we can wonderful any other questions all right well please give martin a big round of applause everyone thank you martin that was a really fascinating presentation we appreciate that so 